This episode of Ben Franklin's World is brought to you by Cornell University Press. When I used to read books that mentioned the Enlightenment, I had to wonder whether the people the author referred to recognized that they were participating in a broader movement, or whether historians invented the term Enlightenment as a category of analysis. That is, I wondered all of this until I read John Dixon's The Enlightenment of Cadwallader Colden, which was published by our friends at Cornell University Press. You may remember John from episode 109, in which he explained that Cadwallader Colden, a Scottish-educated doctor, scientist, and philosopher who settled in New York during the 1720s, understood well that he was part of a larger international movement to explore and increase knowledge of the natural world. Now, many remember Colden as that old, unpopular loyalist governor of New York, but John shows us that Colden was much more than that. Colden was also the gentleman scholar who built a transatlantic network of correspondence that included Benjamin Franklin and Carl Linnaeus. And in addition to building that network, he also pioneered colonial botany, created new theories of animal and human physiology, developed new principles of physics, and authored an influential history of the Iroquois peoples. John Dixon's detailed look into the life of Cadwallader Colden made the Enlightenment accessible to me in ways that it just hadn't been before, because it showed the Enlightenment at work on the ground through the life of one person. Check out our conversation with John Dixon about the Enlightenment and Cadwallader Colden in episode 109. You'll find a link to it in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app. And if you like what you hear and want to know more about the Enlightenment, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Cornell, where you'll find a copy of John's book cheaper than you can find it anywhere else. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 116 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. When we think of the French and Indian or Seven Years' War, we often think of battles. The Monongahela, Ticonderoga, Quebec. However, wars aren't just about battles. They're about people and governments, too. Today, we're going to explore a very different aspect of the French and Indian or Seven Years' War because we're going to explore this war through the lens of disease and medicine by looking at how the war created concern about disease in Great Britain and the steps the British government took to protect its soldiers from it. Our guide for this investigation is Erica Charters, an associate professor of the history of medicine at the University of Oxford and author of Disease, War, and the Imperial State, the Welfare of British Armed Forces During the Seven Years' War. During our conversation, Erica reveals connections between disease and government, the Seven Years' War and the theaters Great Britain fought in, and details about the interest the British government took in disease and its work to help protect its soldiers from it. But first... Have you joined the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook yet? This is where I ask listeners if they have any questions for our guest historians and where I hold my book giveaways. And this is important information to know because I have to hold another book giveaway soon. The community is free to join. All you need to do is click on the Join the Community Now link in your Ben Franklin's World app or visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the orange Join Now button on the homepage. The book giveaway is taking place soon, so be sure you join the community today. Are you ready to explore a very different aspect of the French and Indian or Seven Years' War? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of the history of medicine at the University of Oxford. She's interested in how war and disease intersect with state power and state formation, especially in colonial contexts. And today, she joins us to discuss these topics with details from her book, Disease, War, and the Imperial State, the Welfare of British Armed Forces During the Seven Years' War. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Erica Charters. Thank you. As disease and government are not necessarily two topics that most of us would connect as being interrelated, Erica, would you provide us with an overview of the connections that exist between disease and government? One of the interesting things to think about is what a population actually means to a state and to the power of a state. And especially if we think about this 
for pre-industrial societies, so especially pre-modern societies, places where there aren't machines that are doing most of the work, and places where agriculture is really the basis for producing any kind of products that people are consuming. And what this means is that labor and the labor of women and men themselves is really what produces an outcome. So agricultural labor, military labor, manpower, all things that contribute to how a state is able to extract resources. And so if we think about states in that sense and populations in that sense, you can kind of see how having a very healthy and thriving population actually could be a benefit to a state, even if we think about how populations pay taxes, which go towards the funding of states and of governments. So although in some ways today we have these concerns with overpopulation and having too many people in the world, in the past, for most periods, the main concern was with underpopulation or with a fear of declining population. And so states and governments were actually very interested in keeping a healthy population alive and even in increasing their population, because that would mean that they would have an increase in their labor force, an increase in the size of their armed forces, and of course, an increase in the kind of taxation revenue that they could collect from this population. I think another way we can think about this relationship between disease and governments is thinking about the kind of expectation we have from our own governments when, say, an epidemic disease breaks out. We very often expect our governments to respond to establish some sort of order. And so we see this today. We can also see it in previous periods. So when the Great Plague broke out in Europe, for example, there's an expectation that governments are going to respond by providing social order, by enforcing quarantine, by providing supplies or extra personnel, medical personnel and nursing. Otherwise, those governments are deemed to be irresponsible. They sought to kind of neglect their basic duties. And so in many ways, there's actually this long tradition in which governments are thought to be responsible for the public health, for the general health of the population. And there's also this view that this investment in public health and population health will end up benefiting government. I can see why war would be such a scary prospect if 18th century governments are really worried about underpopulation. Yet, I still wonder why governments in the 18th century feared underpopulation. Well, one of the other interesting things to imagine when we're thinking about these pre-industrial, pre-modern societies is that there's often quite frequently outbreaks of epidemic disease. And so actually you do have cases in which populations are falling instead of increasing. We also have regular outbreaks of famine where there's simply a shortage of food. And so if we're using the data of, say, demographic historians, historians who look at rates of population, we can see that actually population for a long part of history was often decreasing. So it was a very real fear that numbers were going down. And if there weren't sufficient numbers, if we didn't keep that population healthy, then governments really did worry that they would be outnumbered by neighboring countries, they could be invaded, or they could simply lose their labor force, and then they wouldn't be able to produce enough food that would be able to feed the rest of the population. Now that we've explored how the 18th century state viewed the world, let's turn our focus to the state of medicine in the 18th century. Erica's book, Disease, War, and the Imperial State, explores 18th century medicine during the Seven Years' War to assess the extent to which the British government was willing to invest time, energy, and resources into the welfare of its armed forces. Erica, would you tell us about 18th century medicine? What were common notions about disease and how did states and doctors work to keep people healthy? I actually really enjoy thinking about and investigating how people in the past thought about disease and health because there's some aspects which are very similar to how we might think about our bodies and disease and health. And then there's some aspects which are just entirely different. So one thing which people often considered when they thought about their bodies, about health and disease, is that these things were very much interrelated. There's a slightly more, I think, holistic view of health and disease than what we might have. So one notion which is very common, especially in European history, is to think about bodies as being these things compared of four humors, right? So this humoral theory of health and of bodies, humor as being just another word for fluid. So our bodies and ourselves are made up of these four fluids and the kind of ratio of which kinds of fluids we have can change. And that determines not only why some individuals have different personalities than other individuals, these ratios can also change throughout our day. So depending on our emotion, depending on what we eat, they can fluctuate. And also depending on our course of life, they can change 
change when we're younger. We can kind of lose some other fluids when we get older. So there's this notion that our bodies are always fluctuating, but when they're in balance, our own kind of personal balance than we're in health. And it's when we become unbalanced or when we become kind of disordered that we get disease. And so disease is this kind of physical manifestation of this disorder within. And this is very much reflected in the language of the time. So people often call disease, or even if we think about what the word disease comes from, right, being ill at ease with yourself. People often call disease a disorder. And so to show that you're disordered within, At the same time, there's also theories about how diseases can come from the outside. So there's contagious diseases too, things that can be passed from person to person. And especially epidemic diseases were thought to come from air and especially bad air. So air that was a result of things that were putrefying or rotting, which you could detect through bad smells. So things called miasmas. And this is what caused these big outbreaks of diseases, which then could be passed on and then often disordered people. We see this in something like malaria, where the term, of course, simply means malaria, so bad air. So malaria was associated with these places that had bad air, that had damp environments, such as marshes. And of course, we know now that it's exactly in those places, those damp environments, those marshes, that mosquitoes thrive. And of course, that was the vector for malaria. But you can see here how these ideas actually tied in, the observations tied into the theory. And what this meant for individuals at the time, for doctors at the time, for government officials, they could recommend a few things for people to maintain their health and also to try to cure diseases and disorders. So you were supposed to maintain a balanced lifestyle. You should have follow a regular and moderate diet. You should moderate your sleep. You should have moderate exercise, not go to extremes. So this kind of balanced lifestyle, and this would restore the balance or maintain the balance and prevent that disorder or the disease. At the same time, because of this notion of the miasma, of the bad air, the other thing that you could do is to stay away and clear away rotting things and waste, anything that produced bad smells. And so in early modern Europe, there's this movement towards what historians call environmental medicine, where officials are quite clear that what you need to do is ensure ventilation and ensure the kind of constant movement of waters and streams and air. And so buildings are designed, especially hospitals are designed with places where the air is always moving. Even cities are encouraged to be designed in this way so that there's a free flow throughout. And there's also a movement to drain marshes and to kind of clear away the damp of other places which are thought to give rise to disease. Why don't we take a look at how war affected 18th century notions of disease and wellness, especially since wartime, you can't necessarily control your environment. The Seven Years' War or French and Indian War took place between 1754 and 1763. Erica, would you provide us with an overview of where Great Britain sent men to fight during this war? The Seven Years' War, which officially the war happened between 1756 and 1763, which is why it gets its name for seven years. And it's sometimes called the First World War or the First Global War. And this is partly because the locations in which Britain fights really do take place all over the world. So Britain is fighting against France and Britain fights in Europe, in Germany, along the French coast. There's also a few attempts to invade along the British coast, along the Irish coast by the French. Over in North America, the French and the British are fighting in their colonies. And this is where fighting breaks out from 1754, which is why in the U.S. then the starting date is slightly different. The British and the French also fight in the West Indies, so in the Caribbean. They also fight along the west coast of Africa. They fight also in India. And the British even fight versus the Spanish as far away as in the Philippines. But the kind of interesting thing, just thinking about wars and what they're called, is that, of course, I know for Americans, it's called the French and Indian War because that's who the British were fighting in the American colonies. But for other places, especially from a European perspective, it's very much a European war. So Spain is fighting, Austria is fighting, Prussia is fighting, Russia is fighting. And so as with so many wars, the Seven Years' War is this umbrella term we give to what are actually a number of local conflicts that become related throughout the years. Now, in addition to fighting in this global context against enemies like the French, Great Britain also had to fight diseases. Would you tell us about the diseases that plagued the British Army during the Seven Years' War? 
I mean, the interesting thing about disease during war is probably that right up until really the beginning of the 20th century, soldiers and sailors always die from higher rates of disease than they do from combat. And we see this very much during the Seven Years' War. And partly this is really exacerbated and brought out because of these colonial environments. So we have scurvy breaking out, especially along ships, whenever there's long voyages overseas. We also see scurvy in places such as North America during the winter, when it's very difficult for soldiers to access fresh provisions. In these more kind of warm or foreign climates, British troops really suffer from things like malaria in India, along the coast of Africa, and in the Caribbean, what we see are much more kind of violent attacks of fever. So yellow fever, which has very dramatic symptoms such as black vomit, which is what they call it at the time, and other fevers that are associated with those areas of the world. What sorts of infrastructure or systems did the British military have in place in order to combat these diseases? Perhaps you could tell us more about scurvy and the ways the British Army and Navy attempted to fight it. We know scurvy, of course, is a disease that is the result of not having vitamins. And so it's associated with not having fresh fruits and vegetables. And people at the time in the 18th century, they did realize that this was a problem, not having fresh fruits and vegetables as well. But there were simply places and times in which it was very difficult to obtain fresh provisions. And so what we see is very often attempts to try to find alternate cures. So, for example, scurvy breaks out in North America right after the Battle on the Plains of Abraham between the French and the British in 1759. And over the winter months where the British troops are kind of holed up and waiting, there's simply no access to fresh fruits or vegetables. The one thing they do have is they have this thing called spruce beer, which the British really love. And what this develops out of is uh, infusion of spruce in water, which is something which the French Canadians had learned very early on from the indigenous people in Canada, that if you put spruce leaves into water, this gives you a kind of healing drink. And indeed, it does contain vitamin C. And so the British, loving beer, decided to take this recipe and turn it into beer. So they had the spruce infused beer, which they were handing out to their soldiers to try to keep them healthy. The only kind of unfortunate thing is that when you take your spruce water and turn it into beer, then basically all amounts of vitamin C are no longer there. It's negligible. So the spruce beer, although the British soldiers like drinking it, didn't necessarily have a real medical effect on scurvy. So at the same time, they had those diet-based effects. They also had hospital facilities like we would imagine. So they set up a general hospital in main areas. They used New York, a hospital there during the war. They set up smaller hospitals in the field when there were battles. Each regiment had usually a surgeon associated with them. They often had nurses who were on hand to try to help support and care for the soldiers. But very often, as you can imagine, in times of war, there's a kind of ad hoc, make do with what you have sort of medical provision going on. So after the Battle on the Plains of Abraham, for example, the British have possession of Quebec, but they're surrounded by local French forces over the winter. And so they're holed up there. And what they end up doing is making use of the nuns in the Quebec convent in order to nurse the British soldier. So over the course of the winter, you have this kind of odd scenario in which British, mostly Protestant soldiers are being nursed by these Catholic French nuns who otherwise they probably never would have met before. For many months, they're actually working together through their medical care. When you told us about all the different theaters the British armies fought in during the Seven Years' War, you noted that there were different climates in different areas and that different diseases were supported by those climates. Did British medical authorities or military commanders ever advocate for or come to believe that certain types of men would be more effective in fighting in different climates and areas than other men? Yes, they did. It's interesting. There's a theory of disease and especially how disease relates to climate that really developed during this period. A bit like what I mentioned when you think about how different environments have different forms of disease and different diseases seem to attack different people depending on where they were born or where they were brought up. People observed during the war that some diseases, for example, seem to attack only those who are foreign to those climates. So during this period, disease becomes associated with climate. So when the British and the French troops go to serve in Africa, in the Caribbean, in the West Indies, what they notice is that it's really only these incoming new troops, the British and the French, the Europeans, who seem to suffer from fevers. 
whereas it seemed to appear as if the locals, those who were born there, did not suffer from fevers such as yellow fever. So a lot of the medical men start to theorize about this. And a great example of this is a British naval surgeon called James Lind. And based on a lot of the observations that are collected during this war, he writes a text which becomes very influential called An Essay on Diseases Incidental to Europeans in Hot Climate where he notes that through these observations, through this experience of posting Europeans into these foreign and warm climates, as he sees them, Europeans seem to develop these fevers. They basically appear as if they need to acclimatize. They need to be seasoned to these environments through a kind of bout of disease. And once they survive, or if they do survive, that initial attack of disease, then they'll be seasoned and then they can you know, kind of survive and be like a local. And in many ways, this isn't just a theory because we know that there's very high death rates of Europeans, especially when they first arrive in these foreign environments. So when the British first come to fight the French in French-held Martinique and Guadeloupe, they come out with a force of about 5,000 men, and just within two months, they lose pretty much half of their force just to sickness, not to combat, but just to disease. And so throughout the war, people are observing that there seem to be these differences. And so one of the things I'm interested in tracing is how this experience of war, this experience of sending thousands of soldiers and sailors overseas, leads to the development of these theories that certain environments are dangerous to basically what people think of as being these foreign people especially Europeans, those who hadn't been born there or grown up there. And what this meant, of course, is that then people theorized, well, then in order to save this precious manpower, maybe what we need to do is recruit local troops or men who were born and bred in similar environments. And so there is this kind of accepted theory that what you need to do is find people who were born there or who lived nearby. And what we see during the war is that as well as trying to recruit troops who are local to the Caribbean, there's also an assumption that colonial troops, so those American provincial troops, those who are from British descendants but who are born in the American colonies, that they likely also must be seasoned to these warmer environments. And this makes kind of logical sense if you think about the southern colonies and the American colonies. And so they are recruited very specifically in order to deal with the climate and with the diseases of places such as Havana, Martinique, and Guadeloupe. So how did these ideas work out for the British? Were British colonial men more seasoned and more immune to North American and Caribbean diseases than soldiers from Europe? Unfortunately not. And I think this is the interesting thing when we think about observations and theories. So the observation that disease is linked to climate might be very true, but we know that it's not actually climate that is causing these deaths. It's disease. And so these provincial, these American-born colonial troops suffer from the same high rates of diseases as the Europeans, and indeed sometimes even higher rates, because many of them simply aren't used to the kind of life on campaign and the kind of conditions that we see in army camp. And as you can imagine, as a result, there's a lot of complaints from American provincials, from these colonial troops, from colonial governors as well, about these high death rates and this resistance to being recruited to be sent to these areas where they think actually it's very unsafe. And we see references to these high rates of sickness, not only in private letters back home to the American colonies, but even in newspapers that are printed in the American colonies, which obviously makes a lot of people quite unhappy after the outcome of the war, even though the British are victorious. It seems like keeping its soldiers healthy is a really big problem for the British Army because the army needs men to fight, but the environments they're fighting in are full of diseases, which are killing soldiers off. However, as you noted, it seems like the army is trying to find a solution. You mentioned that the army has medical personnel in the field who were observing what's happening to the men as they became ill. It seems like observation played a really big part in 18th century medicine. So I wonder if you would take us through some of the observations these medical practitioners made and whether they led the British Army to any answers about how to protect its men from disease. Yeah, so it's very interesting. You're entirely correct, I think, in kind of this key point of observation. Officials at the time were very keen to record observations. And of course, that is one of the major developments that we see with scientific medicine in this period. So in some ways, although you can't really say there's 
one specific cure that is realized during the Seven Years' War. But what we do see is this attempt to kind of systematize observations. So someone like James Lind, he's a naval surgeon, but he doesn't actually go out to all these theaters of war. What he does instead is he writes letters to many of these military and naval surgeons who do go out to these different theaters. And he asks them very specific questions about diseases. So what diseases do you see in this location? What is the course of their disease? How do they react? How are they different from diseases that we know of back home in Britain? And then he collects all their letters. He often keeps up a correspondence with these individuals after. So luckily we have Lynn's many letters, which he carefully preserves, and then the comments he makes on them when he asks these surgeons again very often after the war when they've returned. So these are all held in Edinburgh and we can see him kind of taking all of these observations and trying to systematize them. And so this is what we have with his book, this way of trying to think about what climate caused certain kinds of diseases and how are they different from the ones that we know in Europe and in Britain and so therefore are there different ways of treating them. So there's that kind of attempt to systematize observation. At the same time, there's also these attempts to try to practice and even an experiment because as you can imagine, the nature of military medicine means that you have these large populations of young men who are usually under your authority. And so you're able to, for example, trial different kinds of drugs, see what the responses are. So again, someone like Lind is known for having a kind of early form of a trial on board ship where he uses different lemons with different drinks to see what helps to cure sailors who have scurvy. And so there's kind of these more general, more casual attempts just to see what might work, what things in a change of diet might help men both get over disease, but also prevent disease from happening. And what's interesting then, if we think about where the investments lie, sometimes what we might miss when we're looking through historical records to try to look for medical progress is that these aren't really drugs per se. These aren't something that we might think of as finding in hospitals. They're very often more everyday items. So changes to diet having fresh provisions, which at the time could mean not just vegetables and fruit, but even things such as having fresh meat instead of salted meat, which is usually what you would serve to soldiers and sailors because it could be preserved. I mean, you can imagine if you're salting meat enough so that it's preserved for months at a time, fresh meat is likely much healthier. So these can be very basic things, which we might miss because it just seems so obvious to us to give someone a regular diet or to make sure that they have sufficient clothing. But in the context of the 18th century, when we think about how most people, most populations were living with very irregular diets and sometimes going without food, sometimes not having proper warm clothing, then actually this kind of basic level of care and provision is a kind of luxury for these types of people. And so that kind of investment, I think I'm quite interested in tracing, not just the investment and not just the practices that we might find in more official medical institutions such as hospitals. Did these I guess we'd call them clinical trials that field surgeons and doctors like Lynn ran lead to any breakthroughs in the search for a cure for yellow fever, malaria or scurvy that the British Army and Navy were actually able to put into practice to keep their soldiers and sailors healthy. No. Again, this is an interesting way to try to think about how do we look at medicine, especially in the past, and how do we judge, say, success or progress? Because in some ways, of course, thinking about finding a specific cure, that's a very obvious way. And I think that's partly because that's the way that we think about medical progress today is we think about a cure for a specific disease. But what we see instead is this development of broader practices, of methods that I think were quite important in shaping the nature of modern Western medicine. So this emphasis on empirical observations and systematic observation and record keeping is something that I mentioned. Even this notion of the regular testing and trial, especially among large groups of populations, this is a very central part to, again, modern Western medicine and how it's used. Even if we think about how records are kept, so one of the things which we see in military contexts is kind of anonymous records, right? So rather than recording the name and the background of every single soldier or sailor that you're testing, you can just kind of note that you tested 10 men. And so even this notion of just having numbers, of having a kind of blank statistical analysis, that's a very different way of thinking about health and of thinking about populations, something which, again, is 
central and which we take for granted in modern Western medicine, but something which seems to develop out of this kind of particular context of war, of military medicine, of these large numbers of men who were spread all over the world. We know from our study of history that the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, cost Great Britain a lot of money. And we know from our own time that healthcare costs a lot of money. I mean, even in state-sponsored healthcare, you're paying taxes to support it. So how did the 18th century British populace react to the interest that the British government was taking in disease and letting military surgeons run experiments, all in the name of trying to keep the nation's soldiers and sailors healthy? There's a lot of public support for investment in troop health. I think we could probably debate whether or not, for example, the public thought that individual trials were that useful. But in general, the notion that the troops were being well cared for was very popular. And public opinion was very important during the 18th century, especially in Britain. You don't need public opinion and public support for the war only because of things such as you want to ensure steady recruitment of men into the armed forces. It's also because taxation in this period is very important in terms of funding the structure that Britain has of how it finances the war by having this public debt. So there's actually a lot of public interest in how the government is conducting its war and whether it's conducting it responsibly. And so we see that there is groups, for example, who start up during the war who collect extra shoes or clothing and send it to British soldiers abroad because they very much want their men to be cared for and well protected when they're out on campaign. What this means on the kind of flip side is how reports of poor health among soldiers or especially reports of disease could become criticisms of the government. And so just like today, in the 18th century, there was very much a partisan battle between these two parties in government over how foreign policy and over how the war was being run. And so opposition politicians during the Seven Years' War actually used reports of disease to criticize the conduct of the war. So when there were debates over which theater they should send their men to, so should they focus on the American colonies or should they focus on Europe? These reports of disease were used by both sides to kind of criticize what decisions were being made and whether or not that was a good decision. And I think disease in this sense is a very powerful tool for public opinion. When we think about what is discussed in terms of war, it's not really disease that we think of as being very honorable. So it might be perfectly honorable for someone to die of a battle wound, but it's not really very honorable to die from scurvy or from diarrhea. This isn't the kind of thing that you put on monuments. So I think just like today's debates around PTSD, public debate at the time about the policy and about the nature of war really did focus especially on this issue of disease, whether or not officials were taking proper care of their troops or making the right decision. And so you could use disease to criticize conduct and public policy. Did your research into the Seven Years' War and connections between disease and the imperial state reveal any differences in medical treatment between British soldiers from the British Isles versus British soldiers from the empire's North American colonies? Because equal treatment among soldiers was something that was very much a concern for North Americans. I think because care in some ways is probably to us very basic in terms of these kind of ad hoc hospitals and the provision of fresh food, basically, and nursing, there's not much of a variation in care. But what we do see is there's a variation in how people experience this care. So one of the things which is very interesting is thinking about how soldiers experience the nature of campaigns. Because, of course, being on campaign isn't necessarily an easy social experience. You have to get used to different kind of food, a different kind of living regime. And so depending on their background, some soldiers, of course, don't enjoy it and also become much more ill. And so the American-born soldiers who join up with the British Army, very often we do see that there are complaints. This is not the kind of lifestyle that they're used to. They're from a different social background in some ways than some of these British soldiers who have come over from Britain. And so we see some friction there in terms of expectations of what living conditions should be like. And at the same time, we see these differences reflected in disease rates. So again, if we think about how disease very often is a product of living standards, and so many of the soldiers who are coming over from Britain are men who have grown up in urban environments, very crowded environments, where they've probably suffered many crowd diseases already, things like smallpox, things like typhus. 
they are therefore immune to these diseases, whereas these American-born provincial soldiers often grew up in communities that were less densely populated. And so they haven't suffered these crowd diseases. And so when they first arrive into these army camps, they start to suffer from these crowd diseases. And so it's very interesting to see contemporaries comment on this about how, you know, these American-born soldiers are just so sickly all the time. They're always suffering from disease, and yet the British-born ones they can observe are not. So there are these differences in terms of how people are thinking about how bodies adapt to different social conditions. Our conversation has centered mostly on Great Britain and British personnel. Was Great Britain unique in its concern for its troops and the actions that it took to protect them from disease during the Seven Years' War? It's a good question, partly because it's something that I'm trying to answer at the moment. One of the things I've been researching since I finished looking at British responses to disease is to look at how French forces responded to disease. And what is interesting is that I think there are some differences. It's very hard to tell in some ways because... Very few people have done the archival research of thinking about how specifically people may have responded to disease at the time. But it does seem as if the French might have invested perhaps at a different level. So the British, partly because they have a much smaller population, they have a much smaller army than the French, seem to be very concerned about investing right at the immediate local level. Whereas the French, you can see a greater investment from the state in their overall French population. So because they, for example, recruit regularly, they have more of a kind of standing army, a regular navy, which is constantly circulating in and out of their seafaring population. The French are more interested in investing at this kind of general, broad level. So rather than focusing on individuals, they seem to focus on the population as a whole. So there's kind of these conceptual differences. But I would say overall, it strikes me that most states are concerned with the health of their populations. It's something that they are aware of. Differences might be how they react to that concern and in what ways and in what methods they have available to them to invest in their health of population. Earlier, you mentioned that as part of his process of observation, Lynn set up correspondence networks to keep up with what other military surgeons were observing and how their patients were feeling. The 18th century was known as the era of the Enlightenment. Did men like Lind share their medical knowledge across national borders, given that it was the Enlightenment? I mean, were there transnational medical communications networks? There are. And this is something which I find very interesting because, of course, we do tend to think of the Enlightenment and this period of this network and this kind of cosmopolitan Europe. But at the same time, then we have this notion of the 18th century as this time when Europeans were constantly fighting each other. And so... One issue which I have been interested in trying to kind of conceptualize in my head is how do these two work together? And what I have found is that actually war in some ways encourages some of these European nations to share information with each other. So what might be surprising is that on the one hand, you may have the French and British officials who are fighting against each other, trying to starve each other out or kill each other. But then at other times, they're exchanging letters, they're exchanging changing foodstuffs and gifts. And even we sometimes see surgeons and physicians actually sharing knowledge and developing something which probably we associate with later periods with this idea that hospitals and medical personnel are kind of outside of war. And so it's actually during this period that European medical men negotiate that one shouldn't attack hospitals, one shouldn't make patients in hospitals any kind of prisoners during wartime, that these are kind of of safe spaces that should be considered neutral in some way. So there's actually this coexistence between these nations that are at war and these nations that are also sharing their knowledge with each other in order to develop a broader practice of European medicine. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Great Britain and France could have avoided the Seven Years' War? What would the lack of that war have meant for the development of medicine? 
This is a difficult question. This is an interesting one because I think when you're a historian, you're kind of tempted to say, well, a lot of these developments probably would have grown out, say, of later wars, or there might have been a focus more on urban health problems, so things that you see among the urban poor in 18th century Britain. But I was thinking about how there might be another way to think about answering this question. And this makes me think of how among historians, among especially medical historians, there's this long-standing debate over the role of war in medical progress. And so there's especially historians who work on the 20th century, this debate over whether war has been good or bad for medicine. So, for example, taking the Second World War and the development of antibiotics, is that a kind of progress? Or actually, if the war hadn't happened, would you have just had it otherwise and it would have been more focused on civilian health? And this debate comes up again about the 18th century, but often I think I agree with a certain medical historian called Roger Cooter, who points out that in some ways this debate is a distraction from the way that we should be thinking about the role of war in history. Because Cooter points out that there's no way to really say whether war is good or bad for medical progress because war is simply part of history. And so if we try to pretend that it's something kind of external to social history, to culture, cultural history, then we're missing how much it simply reflects people's beliefs and practices of the time. And so in some ways, I think obviously the Seven Years' War had some specific consequences and actions that take place. But it is true that it's very much part of the history of the 18th century, the history of what happens in the American colonies. And for many people, this was simply normal life. This wasn't a kind of extraordinary experience. It was simply another day and another way of living their life. So I think that's the best way I can think of answering that question. Earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that you're conducting research into the concerns the French government and French doctors had about the welfare and health of its soldiers. Would you tell us more about this project? As I mentioned, I'm very interested also in thinking about how not only the French and British, but European powers in general shared information and shared knowledge, and especially how they shared this knowledge when they were in distant areas in the colonies or in different parts of the world where they're very far away from their homeland for where they kind of felt safe. And so I'm interested in thinking about comparing these French and British responses and whether or not this is what shaped the outcome of the war. But I'm also interested in thinking about how people collect knowledge during wartime and how people collect knowledge in different environments all over the world and how this shapes modern ways of, say, collecting knowledge and digesting information, whether it's about bodies or whether it's about colonial environments. Where should we look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we still have questions about 18th century medicine and the role that disease played in the Seven Years' War? I'm always very happy to try to answer questions and probably the best way is by email and I don't have a fancy website, but if you Google my name, Erica Charters, I'm sure that you will find my faculty website through the University of Oxford and there it has a list of the projects that I'm working on now and other publications that I have, but it also has my email and I'd be very happy to answer more questions. Erica Charters. Thank you so much for taking us through how people in the 18th century thought about disease and for giving us a very different view of the Seven Years' War. You're welcome. My pleasure. Great Britain didn't just fight France, Spain, Russia, and the Holy Roman Empire during the Seven Years' War. It also fought disease. The ability of a nation, especially that of a small island nation, to protect its troops from disease played a huge role in their ability to keep its men in the field and accomplish military objectives. That's why Great Britain took care to support the work of its doctors and surgeons to make systematic observations about diseases, their causes, and what effects different courses of treatment had on combating disease. These efforts offered hope that its military could keep its soldiers healthy and in the field longer. Now, as Erica mentioned, the medical practices of the Seven Years' War didn't produce any cures to scurvy, malaria, or yellow fever, but it did lead to processes of observation and communication that modern Western medicine still uses today. Also, Erica's point that we need to discard our 21st century knowledge about disease in medicine when we study the history of medicine is an important one. Today, we know about germs and how they spread, the effects proper nutrition has on our immune systems, and the roles good hygiene and fresh drinking water play in preventing disease. People in the 18th century didn't understand this the way we do. They didn't know about the existence of germs, 
and they were only starting to get a handle on the effects of proper nutrition and fresh water. What seems obvious to us today was not obvious to the people of the past. And if we view the past without suspending our present day notions and ideas, it will cause us to misunderstand the past and how people live their day to day lives within it. Look for more information about Erica, her book, Disease War in the Imperial State, plus notes for what we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 116. Speaking of disease and medical history, if you're interested in finding out more about how people in the 18th century understood the natural and biological world, you should really take a listen to episode 109 with John Dixon. John will tell you all about Cadwallader Colden and his ideas about how human and animal bodies processed and digested food. And Colden's ideas led to some really interesting experiments that John will reveal in that episode. Thank you, Cornell University Press, for sponsoring this episode. Cornell has a long history of publishing good books about history. To discover more about Cornell University Press and their great catalog of early American history books, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Cornell. Finally, Erica seemed to think that war should be viewed not as a good or a bad thing, but simply as part of history. Do you agree? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.